Building a bridge, but is it to recovery or an economic bridge to nowhere? This is Bloomberg Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. This week, special contributor Larry Summers of Harvard, Starbucks CEO Kevin Johnson, GM CFO Divya Siriyadavara. We're cautiously optimistic on the recovery of the industry overall, and uh, clearly a very fluid environment. Michael Faroli of J.P. Morgan. The level of GDP is probably going to be at the end of next year, 5% below. We do believe there is some permanent damage uh, to the economy here. Former IBM CEO and Wall Street Week contributor Sam Palmasano. Technology never stops. It never stops. It's on steroids. And it continues to invent itself and reinvent. And GE CEO Larry Culp. We spent the week working on what comes next, with Congress wrestling over how much more fiscal stimulus it can come up with. This is a moment when everyone knows the private sector can't do it, and they have to overcome some of their resistance to letting the government do it, because it's only the government that can help us with the greatest health crisis in 100 years. And the Fed making sure we can borrow all that we need at rock-bottom interest rates. The Federal Reserve has also been taking broad and forceful actions to more directly support the flow of credit in the economy for households, for businesses large and small, and for state and local governments. But as U.S. GDP numbers and corporate earnings showed, the second quarter was really, really bad. We can hope that we've seen the worst of it, that we'll start to climb back out, but it's not going to happen without that fiscal and monetary bridge. And we just have to make sure that it is high enough and that it is long enough. This isn't the first time that we've been stuck. Nearly 20 years ago, we faced a severe economic slowdown in the aftermath of the 9-11 attacks. And contributor Liz Ann Saunders spoke on an earlier version of Wall Street Week about what unprecedented fiscal stimulus could do for the equity markets. Not only has the Federal Reserve continued to lower interest rates, but they pump liquidity into the monetary base we're going to have probably nearly unprecedented fiscal stimulus, and there is a tremendous amount of cash that has been built up on the sidelines that I think, because of the very low yields, will find its way back into the equity markets. Now what was unprecedented seems almost tame, as Congress considers between one and three trillion dollars of additional stimulus. And Wall Street Week contributor Larry Summers of Harvard says it is badly needed. We need fiscal stimulus that includes health investments, so we eventually do the testing that's going to be necessary. We need to support state and local governments who are at huge risk of exacerbating the downturn by laying off people in education and health care, just when basic services, just when those things have never been uh, more important. We need to take advantage of this moment of epically low interest rates and super high unemployment to better maintain and reinvest in the infrastructure of our country. We need to make uh, investments in continuing to support um, American uh, households and American small businesses uh, through uh, what we have uh, gone uh, through. Look, we have uh, been on a bit of a stimulus high in terms of consumer spending. And if we try to go off it cold turkey, the withdrawal symptoms for the economy are going to be something terrible. It would be a huge mistake. We need a protracted uh, fiscal infusion into uh, the uh, uh, economy that tapers off uh, fairly gradually, measured with uh, the progress in health conditions enabling people uh, to come to work. We need a much more sophisticated debate and discussion uh, than uh, the one we're having. 
Larry, why do we need more? Not more than we've had in the past, but more than other people need. I mean, we now have an historic 750 billion euro fiscal stimulus package. That's still far less than what was done here. And if you look at China, it's quite stunning, I think, in some ways, how little stimulus they put in, and yet their economy seems to be doing better. As Europe seems to be coming back faster than we do, why are we lagging? We're lagging in part because we haven't done what we needed to do on the healthcare side. And we've still got to compensate for a ton of fear. We've still got to compensate for a ton of uh, lost income. We've still got to compensate for a ton of business uncertainty. That's one part of it. Second, those countries, particularly in Europe, because they have a different system than we do, they have more of what economists call automatic stabilizers. Whenever the economy goes down, automatically transfers go up. We don't have as much of that because we don't have as much social insurance, and therefore we've got to do it with discretionary policies, what they have built in uh, automatically uh, to uh, their uh, budgets. And third, they never got as much of a stimulus high, and so they don't have the same kind of withdrawal symptoms risk um, that uh, we do in terms of near-term growth rates. Those would be the, those would be the right. considerations that seem uh, most important to me. Right. But look, I, I think this is ultimately not a complicated calculus because policy is like is about risk avoidance. If we spend too much, maybe the inflation rate will creep from 1.5 to 2 percent, which after all is the Fed's objective. Maybe we'll have a little more debt because we borrowed at an interest rate that was below one way below 1 percent on average. If we spend too little, Maybe the economy tips into a W pattern and we have another recession that gets people long term out of work to the point where it's hard for them to come back, that causes corporations to cut their R&D budgets, their investments in uh, the future, that reduces the level of uh, capital uh, formation. You know, if you look. The cohorts of kids who came out of college and came out of high school in 1982 when we had a serious recession, in 1991 when we had a serious recession, in 2001 when we had a recession, in 2009 when we had a serious recession, all of them were worse off a decade or more later. And so avoiding another downturn has to be the right policy. Maybe we'll take out a little more insurance than we need. But, you know, I feel good about having bought my life insurance last year, even though I survived. So being more stimulative is insurance against what we need to be most worried about. Larry, this is all on the fiscal side. Let's move over to the monetary side. By all appearances, the Fed is going to keep us close to that zero bound for a long time to come. They don't seem any indication that they would move off of that. Uh, and we need to do that. I think most people agree we need that loose monetary policy right now. But are we doing longer term damage, s structural damage, f damage to the fabric of the economy by having money be so cheap? I'm not worried so much about uh, zero rates, though in general, I'd rather see more of the stimulus come from the fiscal side than from the monetary side. I am more worried about the Fed's intervention in specific markets. It's one thing for the Fed to stop uh, a financial panic by stepping into bond markets as it did uh, two or three months ago. It's another thing for the Fed to be involved in ongoing support of corporations in order just to reduce their borrowing costs. And I worry that when the Fed is a central factor driving the allocation of capital, that capital may not be allocated so well. And I have a bias, and obviously this is too simple a way to say it, but I have a bias that equity capital 
is more of what the economy needs than debt capital, that some of our problems come from the fact that we're long-term over-leveraged as an economy for a variety of reasons, including the deductibility of interest, and that the Fed can only do debt and that it can't do equity. And so relying on the Fed as the instrument, I think is fairly problematic. That was former Treasury Secretary Larry Summers of Harvard. Coming up, U.S. GDP numbers give us a sense of just how bad things were in the second quarter. And economists like Michael Faroli of J.P. Morgan look for indications of how long the turnaround will take. We don't have uh, growth getting back above uh, the levels we saw in the fourth quarter of last year, even through the end of next year. This is Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. This is Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. U.S. GDP second quarter numbers came out this week, and as expected, they were bad, shrinking at a nearly 33 percent annual rate. Michael Faroli, chief U.S. economist for J.P. Morgan Securities, says they were shocking, but not surprising. I think estimates for this quarter uh, have been pretty bad, really, since the end of March, early April, right? So it was no surprise at that time that shutting down a large part of the economy even for a few weeks, it's going to have a pretty debilitating effect on these growth rates, particularly when you annualize them. Uh, so we got pretty much what we were looking for. The composition was also very similar to what was expected, in particular, uh, consumer service spending. So restaurants, theaters, things of that nature really took the biggest part of the hit. Uh, now, you know, obviously the question is, what happens next, given that this was so well telegraphed for so many months in advance? I think you are correct to point to the uh, to the jobless claims numbers because those give us a pretty uh, high frequency look at the economy. And I think really one of the interesting things about this whole COVID experience has been how the whole economics profession and financial markets have really put so much effort into getting things that are available at a weekly or even even a daily frequency. Uh, but what that has meant is that the, the monthly and quarterly numbers we uh, often looked at are now. I won't say stale, but they are. Uh, we're, we're already kind of looking ahead to what July may hold. And, and uh, I think some of the indicators about what July holds uh, it looks certainly a, quite a bit softer than the boomy kind of rebound numbers you had in. Well, the jobless, num the jobless numbers we get every week, which is terribly helpful, but some people are relying on even faster numbers, things like mobility <laughs> numbers that come out that are almost instantaneous. What are you seeing there? Yeah, that's right. So within some of the daily numbers, there's mobility numbers. There's uh, actually an uh, increasing number of credit card and debit card numbers, including from uh, from our bank, as well as uh, that the Bureau of Economic Analysis has been producing. So that gives us kind of a daily look into uh, how spending is uh, is going. And it seems like the rebound in, or the recovery in spending in July um, slowed relative to the pace of May and, and June. Now, it does look like July spending is probably going to be up relative to June, but you got to remember, in May and June, you had really big uh, rebounds, and that appears to be petering out a little bit here uh, in July, and, and particularly in late July. So that suggests, uh, you know, it, it gives us a signal that is consistent with what we're seeing in the jobless claims numbers, which is one of uh, not contraction, but a slowing in the pace of recovery. And, and you know, we dug into such a deep hole in, in March and April that we, you know, we, we need rapid rates of, of growth to hope to get back to where we were. And uh, I think what we're seeing in July suggests that uh, we may not be um, you know, achieving that. So that's uh, a bit of a concern. Um, you know, one thing I would point out is that given what we know about May and June, uh, it seems like the June level of, uh, of activity was above the second quarter average. And so what that's going to mean is that you're going to have, even if you have, you know, sequentially rather soft uh, July, August, September numbers, you could still get a pretty boomy uh, third quarter GDP number, but that may be um, in a way a bit misleading in terms of what's actually going on with the economy as we kind of go through the summer months here into the early fall. 
So, so you, you said it, Michael, the real big question on a lot of people's mind is, when do we get back to where we were? And a lot of us are sort of like the kids in the back of the car. They say, when are we going to get there, Dad, Mom? Uh, are you stretching out that number for you? Because initially people were saying maybe by the end of this calendar year, and that was the first quarter of next year, 2021. What are you at J.P. Morgan looking at now for when you think is a realistic time in the bell curve to basically yeah. be back to where we were? So we don't have... Uh growth getting back above uh, the levels we saw in the fourth quarter of last year, even through the end of next year. Uh, so we have a pretty slow recovery. We think that uh, the level of GDP is probably going to be at the end of next year, 5% below uh, what we thought it was going to be at the end of, uh, of last year. So we, have, we, we do believe there is some permanent damage uh, to the economy here. Uh, and I think the question probably for most people uh, in terms of when do we get there, is when do we get back to full employment? When do we get unemployment levels below 5%? And that's going to be, again, quite some time. It's very hard to see that. We've had some pretty rapid improvements uh, in unemployment the last two months as furloughed workers went back to their old places of employment. And that's kind of a one-time dividend. Uh, going forward, it may be harder to sustain those types of uh, jobs numbers. Obviously, next Friday, the, uh, the marquee uh, report will be the July employment report. Um, uh, and we'll see if we get further improvement there. But right now, with an unemployment rate at 11 percent, uh, getting to 5 percent employment is a, is a pretty long, uh, pretty long journey, most likely. So um, <laughs> when we get there, I, I, I would uh, I would I would uh, caution patients. That was Michael Faroli of J.P. Morgan. Coming up, leading a turnaround in the middle of a recession and a pandemic. We talk with GE CEO Larry Culp about how his hard job got even harder. There's no question we're going to need more time to deliver the financial results uh, that we desire and that we think we're, uh, we're very much capable of. This is Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. This is Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. When Larry Culp took over General Electric just over 20 months ago, he knew he had a big challenge in front of him, streamlining the company, trimming debt, and restoring operational excellence. And that was before a global pandemic took us into a global recession and hit GE's businesses particularly hard. But Culp says it's only accelerated the pace of the transformation. I would say that the second quarter played out by and large as we thought it would. Uh, certainly challenging, particularly in our aviation business, our healthcare business, where we're on the front lines of, of care, even in, in the COVID moment, uh, was a business that saw uh, headwinds as well. So we were down in two of our uh, best and, and, and frankly better cash generators. The turnarounds at Power and Renewable continued to apace, but we really came into this thinking this was an opportunity. Even though the near-term pressures were going to be acute, we wanted to make sure we took full advantage of the situation to accelerate the transformation of GE. And if you look at the pace at which our new leaders have, have assimilated into the business, the adoption of lean principles across the organization, the way we're using digital uh, more broadly to serve customers, they're just a host of examples that I think when the dust settles, in addition to the cost and cash preservation actions that we're taking, that we'll see that we did uh, in time, accelerate the transformation of this company. So, so accelerate the transformation, but the results may be delayed, may they not? Is it extended your timeline when you really expect to turn around? I'll take an example. For example, aviation. Aviation has been hit so terribly hard globally by this pandemic, and it necessarily is hurting Boeing and Airbus and therefore General Electric. David, there's no question we're going to need more time to deliver the financial results uh, that we desire and that we think we're, uh, we're very much capable of. We came into this year thinking that aviation would continue to lead the way in 2020, healthcare right behind it, with the turnarounds that are underway. And I think gathering momentum in both power and renewables, bringing, uh, bringing up the, uh, the, the other half of the company. Now that got put completely on its head. The pressure that we've seen in aviation uh, services and gas power services, even in our pharmaceutical diagnostics business has been acuted. The three, those three businesses together have been down 5x what we've seen more broadly at the GE. And again, those are our higher margin businesses. So we will need more time, but I think we're going to take and make good use of that time 
to complete the transformation. So our confidence is as high as it's ever been, if not more so, but I think we are mindful that uh, we'll need time. Fortunately, with 41 billion of uh, liquidity, having extended another uh, 10 billion of near-term maturities with the 22 billion of debt reduction we've seen since the beginning of last year, we think that we have de-risked the company and position ourselves to uh, to weather this storm. Does it change some of the emphasis, at least, in your transformation? You just mentioned it, actually. Aviation was going to lead the way. It looks like it's not going to lead the way for a while. At the same time, uh, uh, health care really is terribly important. Does it put health care back up higher in your list of priorities as opposed to aviation? Well, David, I think that the businesses in the near term will play different roles. But in the operating model that we are implementing, it's really a bottoms-up approach. So what we want and need to do in every business is crystal clear. The way it all adds up in 2020 or 2021 may be different than uh, what we thought when you and I were together in early March, but what we're doing in the businesses doesn't really change. Certainly we're having to make adjustments at aviation. We've talked about the, uh, the cost and cash actions there, a billion of costs coming out, 2 billion of cash saves in, uh, in process. Unfortunately, we're looking at uh, the departure over the next uh, couple of quarters of probably up to a quarter of our of our team. So those are painful, tough decisions to take, but ones we clearly need to in light of the uh, the demand changes. But relative to what we want to do in the other businesses, that work continues, and their progress in the short term will just be more important to us than it might have been otherwise. Within the business of aviation, does it also change perhaps the arc of that? Because you both sell jet engines and you have maintenance. I think you make a lot of your money actually off the maintenance part. As you look forward, as you talk to Boeing, you talk to Airbus, you take a look at traffic, does it change the emphasis between the one and the other? Not not really, David. What I've really just been, been so thrilled to be a part of these last 22 months is what has been a multi-decade leadership on the part of GE Aviation in the industry broadly defined. We want to continue to, uh, to lead this industry. How do we do that? Uh, technology sits at the core of what we've been able to do with and for our customers over time. And as you indicate, we service our, our engines often over decades in, uh, in close proximity with our, our, our carrier customers. That's a great setup, right? To, to lead with technology and to be so close day in, day out with our, with our customers. So finally, Larry, we, we usually talk about China because you have a fair amount of business in China. China seems to be ahead of the United States right now in recovery. Certainly with aviation, I know you said that it, it's not down as much as it was, that it's better. Can right. we learn something in the United States about what we're seeing in China or are they just two very different creatures? Well, a whole host of different dynamics in many respects, not so much in others, but if you look at the data that we see, again, I, I get a daily report on, on departures. China today, over the last seven days, compared to a pre-COVID period, for departures using our engines, we're down high single digits. That's a long way from where we are in the U.S. As best I can tell, there's not a vaccine in, in play today in, in China. So you've seen a number of other efforts made to reassure the, the flying public, and folks are... Uh, are, are, are flying. So there's going to be an opportunity to learn from that experience as we, as an industry, do all that we can, really on a global basis, to reassure the flying public as to the, uh, the options that they have as they think about uh, transportation in the months to come. That was Larry Culp of General Electric. Coming up, tech in the dock. Congress goes after four megatech CEOs, but former IBM CEO Sam Palmisano says that ultimately it's not the government that shapes the tech business, it's the breakneck evolution of technology itself. I think the biggest issue, at least I've learned over the years, it won't be regulation, it's going to be technology shifts and competition. This is a very, very tough industry. This is Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. This week, Washington tackled the question of whether big tech is too powerful. House lawmakers grilled the CEOs of four of the biggest tech companies in a remote hearing following a year-long investigation. 
Amazon accounts for 38% of online retail sales in the United States, according to eMarketer. In his congressional debut, CEO Jeff Bezos defended his company against claims that it exploits small merchants. Isn't it an inherent conflict of interest for Amazon to produce and sell products on its platform that compete directly with third-party sellers, particularly when you, Amazon, sets the rules of the game? Uh, thank you. No, I don't believe it is. Uh, we have we we have the consumer is the one ultimately making the decisions. Apple is the most profitable company in the United States. Its App Store is at the heart of criticism that it gives itself an unfair advantage. There is a competition for developers just like there's a competition for customers. It's so competitive, I would describe it as a street fight for market share. Social networking giant Facebook was accused of stifling competition through its acquisitions of Instagram and WhatsApp. CEO Mark Zuckerberg shifted the focus to his competitors. In many areas, we're behind our competitors. The most popular messaging service in the U.S. is iMessage. The fastest growing app is TikTok. The most popular app for video is YouTube. The fastest growing ads platform is Amazon. The largest ads platform is Google. Alphabet owns Google and YouTube, both of which rank among the most visited websites in the world. Google controls 59% of the U.S. digital advertising market, according to eMarketer. Isn't there a fundamental conflict of interest between serving users who want to access the best and most relevant information and Google's business model, which incentivizes Google to sell ads and keep users on Google's own sites? We've always focused on providing users the most relevant information, and we rely on the trust for users to come back to Google every day. In fact, the vast majority of uh, queries in Google, we don't show ads at all. But as big as some tech has gotten, and as much as some may fear or resent it, it's far from clear that the antitrust laws are the way to handle it. Something Sam Palmasano, former head of IBM and Wall Street Week contributor, knows from firsthand experience. If you go through how the Justice Department, at least in the United States, would view antitrust or anti-competitive, it's based upon impact to the consumer you know, or to the buyer versus the competitor like it is in Europe, as you know, David, it's the European model is different than the US model. And if you look at most of their business models, the services they provide are basically free or very low cost. So it's hard to really measure the, that size or that size scale drives low cost, obviously, but that hasn't benefited the consumer. I think the issue here is not gonna be traditional antitrust or anti-competitiveness. I think the issue is gonna be market influence not dominance, right? Now that's a hard, I think, I'm not a lawyer, but you are, but a hard definition to really prove. But one of the things that is being alleged here by some is that when you're really dominant in one place, like for example, Apple with the App Store uh, is, is really quite strong, Google with search, Amazon Correct. with acquisition, that it's very hard not to sort of put your thumb on the scale when there are ancillary businesses and favor your business over other business. What about that? Wasn't that sort of the Microsoft argument? Well, fundamentally, I mean, you go through, it's like a tie-in sale. Go back right. to this. They would, you would say that it's a connected tie-in sale. Yes, and that is a legal issue if they truly are doing that. Are they putting their thumb on the scales? Are they really using algorithms to their advantage? Um, you know, that will be, I mean, we'll see as that plays out. I don't have any facts one way or the other. My guess is these sophisticated, mature companies like Apple would be very cautious in doing things like that. The younger companies, they had, you know, they'll grow through this and they'll learn. Like we learned at IBM because we got sued on all these issues. Uh, bundling is an issue we got sued, antitrust we got sued. So as the Watsons, the founders uh, migrated to maybe professional management, we transitioned the company from the growth strategy, the entrepreneur driving phenomenal growth, to more of one that you view as a, a more mature company at that point in time. And what about for the really big companies, such as some of these mega tech companies are in their acquisition strategy? Can it be anti-competitive? Because there are allegations about things like Snapchat, things like Instagram, that essentially they suppress right. competition that otherwise would be a competitor to them. I, I, I don't think so. Here's why I don't think so. If you go through when those acquisitions were done, they were in their growth phase. So if you're in the growth phase and you're management and you're trying to scale and grow this company to size, that's where your focus is strategically. You're not defending your base. That would occur, I mean, 
you know, when you become 100 years old and you, uh, your growth slows and now you have more of a, I'll call it a stable business model versus a high growth model, you might at least look at those sorts of options. I just believe those companies were in the growth phase. They were looking for areas to expand growth. In the Facebook example you've mentioned, I mean, the more users they have, it's a bigger base for their advertising models. Also true for Google, it's a bigger base for their advertising models. I just believe that the strategy of the company then was grow, 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 grow. Now, I mean, you know, we'll see 20, 30 years from now if that behavior would continue to exist because, as you know, the expectations of Wall Street are going to change as these companies will mature and stabilize. But on antitrust, I think the biggest issue, at least I've learned over the years, it won't be regulation. It's going to be technology shifts and competition. This is a very, very tough industry. I spent 40 years in it. Technology never stops. It never stops. It's on steroids. And it continues to invent itself and reinvent. And those transitions is where when IBM went through antitrust, we missed the basically PC client server ear. That's what hurt IBM, led to the restructuring. Now, obviously, IBM recovered since then. When Microsoft went through it, they missed the Internet. Obviously, they've done a nice job with new management, Satya, re recovering from that. I can take you through Intel as well, but fundamentally, you, you can see uh, what happened over time. Now, I know it's hard for regulators and for governments to have the perspective of this is will happen over time. So if you have a concern, what should that concern be? And let's focus there. Quite honestly, I think the bigger concern to me is responsible use of the data and privacy. That is a bigger societal effect than whether they do something for free and sell an ad. Sam, you mentioned Intel, big news out of Intel that they are at least considering the possibility of moving away from chip manufacture as opposed to design. They've really had, as I understand it, an essential part of their strategy to do both together. How big an earthquake is that in the tech area? Well, I guess it, it's, it's, again, it's a technology transition. If you go through, when Intel and the PC, like when the PC centric model drove the technology industry, Intel and Microsoft were the two big winners. And uh, uh, those others like Dell, IBM, Compaq, HP, et cetera, we did, we did well, but they were the winners and they all came under scrutiny. And we, I, I referenced the Microsoft suit, Intel as well. Now what's happened is this technology, this, which is the wafer size and the dimensions of the, of the etched lines that the, the, the build these chips, called nanometers. It's moving very, very quickly. You're going from 10 to seven to three, and it's very expensive to make that transition technologically and production challenges associated with it, which you heard they had a delay, which is not unexpected given the challenges of those technology shifts. My only point is, as you move down that scale, you need to differentiate your model other than just on production capacity. And mm -hmm. that's where Intel had great design, x86 architecture at PC, and wonderful production capacity. And they did, a, Andy Grove and those guys did a great job. Uh, now having, and they were competitors of ours, but they, of ours, IBM, but they really did a great job. Now you, you put that aside, that's all changed. And that model is changing. So I think what you heard announced uh, with earnings was that they're reflecting on that model. Now it's a transition. I can't imagine they're gonna go a completely shift from a design production fab company to want to strictly design, like AMD has made the transition to strictly design, and they use Global Foundries as the fad. Uh, uh, one of the things that megatech, the big tech company, companies claim, is that we need bigger tech in the United States to compete with the Chinese, because there's a very big competitor globally uh, on, the, on the playing board. Is that right? What is the situation in tech in, as we compete with China? I believe the way we compete is the way we competed in the past. That doesn't mean we sit and we throw rocks at each other, China, US. It doesn't mean we start set off global trade wars or cold wars or cold wars on economics or those sorts of things. You know, it means that we enable the private sector with government and with the research organizations, that tends to be the leading universities, to scale these businesses to compete. That was Wall Street Week contributor Sam Palmasano. Coming up, we hear from GM's chief financial officer about what it's done to weather the second quarter storm and why she thinks it's well positioned for what comes next. It's trending in the right direction. It's, it's difficult to call when it will be back to pre-pandemic level. This is Wall Street Week on Bloomberg.
This is Wall Street Week, I'm David Weston. The second quarter was an ugly one for the automobile industry, with vehicle sales plummeting and plants shuttered for a good part of the quarter because of COVID-19. But GM weathered the storm better than expected, and its chief financial officer, Divya Surya Devara, says they're on the road to full recovery, sooner or later. We're cautiously optimistic on the recovery of the industry overall, and uh, clearly a very fluid environment, but um, both on the production side and the um, demand side of things, um, we're seeing a steady recovery. Just to stay on the demand side, just for a moment, uh, the entire economy hit an air pocket here, obviously because of COVID-19. Uh, do you have a sense overall for vehicles, because we know General Motors has been doing very well in pickups. Overall, when do you think you're gonna be back to where you were before the pandemic in terms of demand for GM vehicles? It's, it's really difficult to say, uh, to your point, it's a very fluid situation. Uh, we think that for the second half of the year, the light vehicle SAR is going to be around 14 million units. Um, and uh, coming in for the year, as you know, David, we were expecting closer to 17 million units for the year, and now we think it's going to be closer to 14. Uh, it's trending in the right direction. It's, it's difficult to call when it will be back to pre-pandemic uh, uh, levels. What about consumer credit? I mean, uh, GM finances a fair number of these vehicles. Are you seeing increased delinquencies? Is there some difficulty people financing these things? So our GM financial arm has uh, uh, stepped in and provided a lot of support during these difficult times to dealers as well as our consumers. And we have received requests, uh, especially back in March, uh, April and May timeframe, for deferrals of payments, and we've had uh, lease extension requests, and we have been honoring them. And what we're seeing more recently uh, towards the end of the second quarter is uh, people coming back and uh, paying those, and a lot of these um, requests that we received, uh, our consumers have come back and paid in full. So we are watching it closely, but people have um, been, um, uh, especially towards the end of the quarter, uh, getting back to um, uh, closer to normal levels of uh, repayments from a financing standpoint. Uh, that's on the demand side. What are the supply side, the extent to which you're back up close to where you were at full capacity? I know you've led with the pickups once again, but where are you overall in your r rate of production right now? So we've put extensive safety measures in place, and they have been very effective. And that's allowed us to get back to the levels that we were prior to the crisis with over time. And in the pickup, uh, full-size pickup facilities, we're running three shifts as well. So um, we have been able to um, get back to uh, rebuilding inventory, which is really the focus, um, and to do so in a safe way. And um, uh, we think the safety protocols are working. We're encouraging our team members to follow them even outside of our facilities and really contain the spread. And um, it's a, it's a, it's a um, situation that changes on a day-to-day -day basis, but one that's been manageable so far. Uh, China is terribly important to GM in addition to North America. China obviously has had a couple of very weak years in terms of overall demand for vehicles. Where is China right now in the recovery process? How far ahead of the United States are they? So China has been nicely recovering from the pandemic. And as you know, David, they uh, went through, they were early in the process from when they bottomed out, which happened really in Q1. And from there on, it's been improving. And Q2 was that we saw a nice recovery there. Some of that may have been pent up demand from Q1. And some of that is real recovery. And so that's something we're, we're watching very closely. Divya, you're talking about the longer term future of the business. We have to talk about electric vehicles, autonomous vehicles. I know you've got a plan in August, actually, to release the, 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 the Cadillac version of electric vehicle and then more later on in the, in the fall. Give us a sense of where General Motors is. If you had to slow up at all your release of EVs. Not at all. We, we're full speed ahead from an EV standpoint. And uh, as you know, we've been making significant investments in this area. And uh, if we're going to continue making significant investments in this area as well. That's not slowed down because of the pandemic. Um, we are uh, keeping our investments in future areas very much intact as we've gone through this. Uh, from 2020 to 25 alone, David, we're putting in $20 billion into these programs. Tesla's had quite a run of it. Can you catch them? Well, what we believe in is our plan, and we've been executing to our plan, and we're very excited about our own launches. And um, what this signals is really the market's belief in the future of EVs, and we share in that view and the optimism there. That was Divya Siri Devara, GM CFO. Coming up, 
Starbucks is starting to see a rebound as well. But CEO Kevin Johnson says that the pandemic has changed the ways and the times we all are getting our lattes. We're still seeing continued improvement in our morning peak, but we're seeing some of those customer occasions shift to a little bit later in the morning. This is Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. This is Wall Street Week, I'm David Weston. Starbucks got hit hard by the pandemic, first in China and then in the United States, leading to a big loss in the second quarter. But now it thinks it's bottomed out. And as customers and sales come back, CEO Kevin Johnson says they'll return to pre-COVID levels, though it will take some time and the nature of its business will change. As you recall, in the month of April, uh, we closed all our stores in the U.S. with the exception of drive throughs so that we could uh, provide a safe experience for our partners and our customers. In doing that, we also provided economic certainty to our partners, and we paid them, you know, even if they were staying at home and not working. And uh, that, in addition to serving the frontline healthcare workers free coffee, you know, those are things that we think are good long-term investments because they built trust. They built trust with our partners, trust with our customers and trust with uh, the communities we serve. And as we began to reopen stores, we've been you know, clearly driving our recovery. And we saw that accelerate throughout the month. Uh, and, and certainly uh, what customers are looking for right now, David, are experiences that are safe, familiar, and convenient. And so we sort of have optimized in the ability for us to provide those, whether it's through drive-through, for mobile order, for pickup, uh, delivery, and now we're introducing curbside service. And so, you know, we, we continue to see this, uh, this recovery unfolding, and we're, we're in a good position now to drive, uh, to drive this recovery on a global basis. Exactly right. That, the numbers reflected that, but I still want to be the kid in the back of the car about when we're going to get there. Uh, and obviously, the, the virus itself gets a vote, but if things keep going the way they're going, let's go forward. March 31, 2021, do you think you'll be on a pace to equal what you were before the pandemic? You know, in the United States, that uh, that we saw, you know, we saw what we called uh, substantially recovered as being back to where our same store comparables were a year ago, and that that would happen, you know, sort of in the first half of our fiscal year 21, which would be, you know, by by March of uh, 2021. Uh, in China, it's a quarter earlier, and so. You know, this path won't be linear, but every, you know, every month we've seen continued improvement. And in fact, you know, in the month of July in the U.S., I think we had a minus 19 percent same store comparable. July, that accelerated to a minus 14 percent. And so as we do new things, like we're introducing curbside service in 700 to 1,000 stores uh, by the end of this quarter, all of those things are helping us give more throughput and capacity for these safe, familiar, and convenient experiences. And that's going to drive this recovery. So you obviously have been in China a very long time. As you say, China's a little bit ahead of the United States in terms of recovery. But taking a look at those two, in the United States, we have some flare-ups here in some states, more than what we've seen really in China. What is the threat to Starbucks recovery from things like what's going on in California, in Texas, in Florida, in Arizona? Well, you know, I'll point out that China has also had that. You know, you look at Beijing, uh, you know, several weeks ago had a, a similar flare up. And, and so, you know, what, what, what we have done, David, is we have built store protocols and the operating capabilities for us to carefully dial up the experiences we open up for customers, like limited seating or seating in our cafes, or dial it back if we need to, if we need to dial back in a certain market for a period of time while, while the mitigation is taking place. We're able to do that on a store by store basis. And so, you know, what we've done is we've now built that, those store protocols and that operating capability into the fabric of how we, how we run the company. And that allows us, you know, if there's a flare up in Miami, for example, we can turn the dial back slightly, still stay open, still serve customers safely, but we can constrain some things. And as, uh, as the curve flattens and improves, we can dial back up. And so we're doing that in 32,000 stores around the world, and it's working. Uh, and so I'm confident, you know, we've built uh, the capability to navigate in a COVID world until there's a vaccine and more therapeutics and, and we get through this. 
And, uh, and we've done all that in the last three to four months, and we've done it uh, in over 80 uh, two markets around the world. Kevin, you mentioned the drive throughs You're building a lot of drive throughs and also curbside delivery, things like that. Are we witnessing perhaps a longer-term strategic pivot by Starbucks away from the so-called third place where you go and you gather there like a cafe as opposed to something you just pick it up and go on? Yeah, David, I, I don't see this as, as uh, a strategic pivot away from the third place experience where, where, where people want to come sit in, in Starbucks and be part of a community. I see what we're doing is complementary to that. And, and if you look at pre-COVID, in fact, roughly 80% of our customer occasions uh, before COVID were for customers who wanted to, t to their food and beverage to go. Kevin, are you seeing a change in the pattern of when people come to Starbucks and what they get at Starbucks? Because in the, in the gold oil days, we'd go into an office. A lot of people are working from home now. It doesn't look like they're going to go back right away. I mean, right here at Bloomberg, there's a Starbucks just downstairs. You might grab one on the way into the office. We don't have as many people working here anymore. Is that changing your business model? You know, it, it has changed customer behavior. It has changed the pattern. For example, you know, the morning peak in the United States, you know, really a lot of that was uh, when people are on their way to work or to school, they'll stop by Starbucks on their way in. And so as people are working from home during this period or as schools are closed and students are schooling from home, what we've seen is, you know, we're still seeing continued improvement in our morning peak, but we're seeing some of those customer occasions shift to a little bit later in the morning. Instead of maybe 7.30 to, to 9 a.m., they might shift to 10.30 a.m. And then we're also seeing those same customers have multiple visits in the day. They might come in and get their beverage at 1030. They might come back at 2 p.m. in the afternoon for an afternoon occasion. So these are all the things that we monitor around, around our customers' behavior. And that really was what in, has informed us on the strategic initiatives that we're implementing to really future-proof the company. Um, and so, you know, we're watching that very closely and we're adapting very rapidly. And that's what's helping fuel the recovery. And it's also helping... Uh, you know, helping us position for the long-term uh, initiatives that we're driving. That's Starbucks CEO, Kevin Johnson. Finally, one more thought. Having a what we used to call Kodak moment in the age of the coronavirus. Kodak stock went up more than 2,700% this week. Not because the old Kodachrome film is on the way back, but because the Trump administration has decided Kodak can help with high-priced pharmaceuticals if it ramps up making chemicals that go into generics. And the administration is prepared to give Kodak a $750 million loan to get it started. President Trump praised the deal. My administration has reached a historic agreement with a great American company. You remember this company? It's called, from the good old camera age, the old days, to begin producing critical pharmaceutical ingredients. It's called Kodak. And it's going to be right here in America. Never mind that right now Kodak is a very small player in this business, or that it has tried over the years to make a series of pivots from obsolete film into everything from cryptocurrencies to nuclear reactors. Presidential advisor Peter Navarro says this will be the making of New York as an industrial power. F. Scott Fitzgerald may have said there are no second acts in American lives, but then again, Mr. Fitzgerald may not have been thinking about the lives of American companies. That does it for this episode of Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. This is Bloomberg. See you next week.